So Dr. Julie Tompkins uh, will be sharing with us about the field of immunopsychiatry, addressing inflammation and the treatment of depression, one of the many facets of integrative psychiatry and psychiatry. Julie earned a bachelor's in arts in English and French from Tulane University and a master's of arts in linguistics from the University of Oregon. She then spent many years as a teacher before attending medical school at the University of Arizona, Tucson, where she graduated with distinction in community service, pathology, and integrative medicine. She will be completing psychiatry residency at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Tucson Psychiatry Residency Program in a month, uh, in June of 2023 and is thrilled to be staying in Tucson to work at the Southern Arizona VA. Yay! Um, well, with that, I uh, just want to say that um, uh, Julie is a delight, and I can't wait for us to all hear from her. So, Dr. Tompkins. As Dr. Ramshabar said, I'm about to finish up my residency, so um, I am not yet, you know, in regular practice, and I just want to put the caveat out there that I am just an enthusiast on this topic, not an expert, and I'm not a researcher, um, and, uh, you know, I tried to distill a very large field into something for my colleagues and um, co-residents when I presented this for the first time a few months ago. So it hopefully it, you know, gives everybody a review, but it may not go deep into any one part of this. So um, I'm happy to, you know, take questions and, and open to discussion at the end, or you can interrupt me um, during. Um, and hopefully I, you know, don't make any egregious errors or misstatements. And um, it's been a while since I was reading all of this literature, a couple of months. Um, so I may not have the specifics of some of the studies I cite right on hand, um, but I have a reading list or um, a citation source that I can um, share at the end. All right, so the title of my talk is um, Immunopsychiatry, Addressing Inflammation and the Treatment of Depression. There are my um, learning objectives. And while I have no disclosures, I do have a black box warning, but black box warning in the sense of a mysterious or hidden internal mechanism. So inflammation here on the left is an input into the brain, and then the depression is an output. But what goes on exactly in these black boxes? So why this title, Immunopsychiatry? Um, without time to give a full history of the field, I do think it, the use of this word highlights where a shift in the spotlight has gone over the decades. So this seminal textbook called Psychoneuroimmunology, first published in 1981, emphasized how behavioral, neural, and endocrine processes all impact the immune system. Then flash forward 40 years and the order of the root words has reversed and you see immunopsychiatry. And in fact, there's not one, but three textbooks recently with this title. And this points, I think, to the spotlight on the immune dysfunction, including inflammation first and psychiatric manifestations later. There are lots of ways the immune system affects psychiatric diseases, um, schizophrenia and dementia very notably, but I'm just going to address inflammation as it relates to depression in this talk. And again, if um, I gloss over nuance, um, apologies as I attempt to distill a lot of complexities. So why this topic for me? Well, the connection between inflammation and depression is out there, it's in the news. Patients are bring, you know, may bring it up. This is a sampling from my newsfeed um, just a few months ago and um, how even though it seems to be in the news, this topic is, this concept is not new. These special reports were published in 2018 in the Psychiatric Times by key figures in the field, Dr. Charles Raison, Andrew Miller, and others. It was a digestion of what was already decades of inquiry and observation. 
And I first became aware of Dr. Raison's work early in residency through the excellent video lecture series we um, have in integrative medicine here. And um, in one of his modules and videos, which Dr. Ranjabar mediated, um, he suggested for one thing that you might favor, say, bupropion um, over an SSRI by itself if your patient with depression had an elevated C-reactive protein. So I tucked that information away thinking, oh, surely I'll be seeing this done um, or I'll hear more about this. And now here I am at the end of my residency and um, I personally have never ordered a CRP on anyone. Um, I have of course recommended anti-inflammatory diets and discussed with patients, um, but I'm just wondering, have I been missing something that really could have been helping my patients? And can I understand this better? So this led me to um, coming up with these six questions that organized my uh, research and that will organize this talk. Um, what do we really mean by inflammation as it relates to depression? Uh, what do we really know about um, its contributions to depression and by what mechanism? And then should I actually be ordering specific labs or changing what antidepressant I use or prescribing other anti-inflammatory agents? So here we go. What do we mean by inflammation as it relates to depression? So this is the inflammation we learned in medical school. An injury, a pathogen is detected by the immune cells that are on guard. There's a rapid release of local chemicals. Uh, a complex and coordinated response is mounted, in particular by the macrophages, which release cytokines and call more fighters over to the fight. And then ideally, there are stop signals and resolution. And this kind of inflammation can also happen in the brain if there's a direct invasion, as you can see in these examples of bacterial meningitis and various viral infections. But for inflammation related to depression, we're largely not talking about this classic uh, inflammatory process. We're talking more about what happens if an inflammatory process in the body remains ongoing such that the systemic signaling cascade which is, you'll see here, uh, is remains turned on and producing pro-inflammatory cytokines or remains in the pro-inflammatory direction. So this is a busy figure, but the key players are in the middle, the, ma the pink macrophage, and then the cytokines, the letters and numbers in black um, throughout. They're being sent out to other immune cells, to various tissues and organs. The T cell also central there um, in yellow. These are proving more and more relevant to inflammation and depression, but that is going to be for another talk. I'm largely not covering T cells today. But a review of cytokines briefly. These are small proteins that bind to cell receptors and ultimately alter gene expression. They interact with each other and with their targets in very complex ways, sometimes synergistically, sometimes antagonistically and there's broad uh, regulatory functions that they have. This signaling, these signaling processes should be short-lived because cytokines have very short lives um, and their stop signals inherent. However, things can go awry when the injury never fully goes away or the signals are not turned off. So how does this systemic inflammation in the body make its way to the CNS? So in this um, illustration, let's focus on the blue key figure in the middle. That's the macrophage. Here it's um, in large and labeled monocytes. So just to review from medical school, monocytes and macrophages are from the same lineage. Monocytes are the ones running around in the blood on guard for damage or for non-self signals, whereas macrophages reside in tissue. Now, starting at the bottom of this illustration, um, we're somewhere in the body, and if the macrophage or the monocyte detects a bacteria, then through nuclear kappa factor B inside the monocyte, um, pro-inflammatory cytokines are activated and produced. Alternatively, the macrophage down here on the bottom right, somewhere in the body picks up on endogenous damage like glucose or uric acid running around where it shouldn't be, then a different process inside the monocyte, the um, NLRP3 pattern recognizer in this um, 
light oval there. Um, this will become activated and then called an inflammasome and will set off the release of, of inflammatory cytokines. The cytokines then travel or their signals travel to the brain in three different ways. It can be direct in the blood and cytokines can cross the blood brain barrier or through the vagus nerve signaling or by um, monocytes themselves, which are now increasingly being produced from the bone marrow due to the signaling. They can travel to the brain and um, add to the macrophages that are already living there and all of them are activated in a pro-inflammatory direction. And then notice the light purple cells inside the brain at the top. Um, now they're a different color over here, but these are the microglia, the very important microglia. So these are from the same lineage as the monocytes and macrophages. So they have the same internal machinery, which can become activated um, or polarized when they detect damage signals. And they too can release locally cytokines in the brain. Important to note here, the most potent activator of the inflammasome in CNS monocytes and macroglia is increased extracellular ATP, which is produced in, in the setting of neuronal damage or stress. So this is how chronic inflammation can reach the brain. Um, but what's the evidence that, and these are the key players, sorry, down here, um, and the cytokines that are key, I haven't been naming them, are IL-6, IL-1, beta, TNF, alpha. Um, but so if this is chronic inflammation and it does in fact reach um, the CNS, what's the evidence that this systemic inflammation is related to depressive symptoms? So um, it's easy to observe how sickness behavior during and after an acute infection shares many features with depression. Like this um, puppy here, you don't want to get out of bed, you're not interested in playing or learning new tricks, you're not hungry, you want to sleep. It's also been observed that in, in large population sets, um, people with a history of serious early life infections or with chronic inflammatory diseases um, or people having flares of those diseases, all of this is associated with a higher risk of developing depression or a higher risk of worsening depression. Additionally, patients with depression exhibit all the cardinal, cardinal features of chronic inflammatory responses. So both peripherally, um, elevated IL-6, TNF-alpha, CRP, elevated peripherally in the blood, and centrally, so they can observe uh, activated microglia on imaging. So surely depression and inflammation are associated, but could, you could argue that just having a chronic physical illness with pain, with dysfunction, that could cause depressed mood um, regardless of inflammation. But there are substantial uh, findings suggesting more of a causal relationship between inflammation and depression. So in several large longitudinal studies, an elevated CRP or IL-6 or other inflammatory cytokines at one point in time um, was found to be predictive of developing depression later in life or at later follow-ups and in a dose-dependent way. Additionally, if you administer an endotoxin or a typhoid vaccine or give just straight pro-inflammatory cytokines, then depressive behaviors very often follow, and they um, evidence of that um, is seen in decreased motivation and motor activity and brain circuits, and increase in the alarm and anxiety circuits. And then finally, treating inflammation has been shown to reduce depressive symptoms. For example, in people with autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, um, treatment with antipsychotic therapies uh, like infliximab. In most of all these, in most but not all of these studies, the decrease in depressive symptoms was found to be independent of the improvement in the actual autoimmune or inflammatory disease itself. Um, so, hopefully, with this brief, brief overview of the uh, the association, you can see how inflammation could be understood to be a cause of depression. Surely we're all, we're all aware that um, the relationship is probably bi-directional. And of course there are other things that can cause depression, but um, 
but there is a, you know, emphasis on the arrow going from inflammation to depression um, as more and more studies are showing. So if chronic inflammation in the body involving ma macro macrophage activation here and cytokine signaling that reaches the brain, and if depression can be the outcome, what exactly are those cytokines doing in the black boxes to explain that? So let's finally take a look. This is going to be a complicated slide here, but I'll go through it, starting on the top left. Um, so pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, when they are in the brain, can increase oxidative stress. Um, and then basically as a result, um, tetrahydrobiopterin will be oxidized and then it cannot be used for monoamine synthesis. The cytokines will also activate the enzyme indole indoleamine dioxygenase, which uses up tryptophan, which now can't be used for monoamines. And then also through the cytokines through MAPK pathway, decrease the VMAT, so the transport of serotonin and dopamine. And then they increase um, the transporters of serotonin and dopamine back. Um, so the sum total of that, sorry if I didn't explain it uh, well elegantly, is that there's decreased monoamines available in the synapse. So that's one way. Top right, um, cytokines signal to astrocytes locally to increase glutamate release and then inhibit glutamate reuptake. So now there's extra synaptic glutamate, some of which hits the NMDA receptors and causes a decrease in BDNF. And the sum of this is that you're going to have excitotoxicity, which is toxic. Um, so then moving to the bottom right, um, inflammatory cytokines have direct interference with BDNF, um, preventing neurogenesis and neuroplasticity and decreasing dendritic sprouting. And so the sum of that is um, decreased, sorry, yeah, decreased growth factors and decreased neurogenesis. And then, you know, in terms of the actual neural circuitry in the middle, um, the changes that we see with increased cytokines in the brain, there's a decrease in the activation of the reward circuitry and an increase in the activation of the arousal anxiety and alarm circuitry. So now that I feel that I have a better understanding of the mechanism by which systemic inflammation may contribute, cause, or perpetuate depression, what do I practically do about it? Um, so you since you can't measure, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, um, maybe we should be getting biomarkers. And so far, we've been talking about cytokines in this, in this discussion, but what about CRP? So let's just review um, where CRP comes from. All right. Um, so at the top, you have um, damage um, from infection or in endogenous damage, you have macrophages getting activated and um, producing inflammatory cytokines. Those cytokines also travel, uh, besides everywhere else we've talked about so far, travel to the liver and adipose tissue. And that, in both of those locations, CRP is made. But notice there's no brain in this um, schema. CRP does not cross the blood-brain barrier. It's not a cytokine itself, but it's a proxy for cytokine levels and for inflammation. So you might be thinking, well, we should just directly measure the inflammation and not the CRP. But the problem, one of the problems with that is it's just is the complexity of that inflammatory signaling. So this web graphic on the bottom left illustrates just the three highest magnitude coupling paths for each cytokine and its own self-inhibition signal. So you can imagine it's difficult to tell what a, a level of one of these cytokines is at any point in time, what it actually means. So right now, the most practical measurement we have to, to gauge systemic inflammation is 
is CRP, which is um, indirect. There are several pros to using it. It's cheap, it's shelf stable, it already has significant cutoffs designated um, in cardiology. Um, the cons are what I've already mentioned, that it's not a direct measurement. Um, and maybe the other cytokines are more directly correlated to depressive symptoms. Um, And some experts um, conclude after hundreds of papers testing, looking into this, that no single cytokine or a combination of cytokines is robust enough, robust enough yet to use in a clinical setting. But so CRP is kind of the best we have right now. Um, but whether you use CRP um, or a better biomarker is identified in the future, the first question I guess would be, is there, are there enough patients with depression who also have inflammation to even make a biomarker useful? So I'll talk about this study that's often cited, analyzed a large group of patients with um, diagnosed depression and found that one in four um, had what's considered high-risk CRP based on cardiac standards. It's, a, it's called here low-grade inflammation, but that's a high-risk CRP. And um, over half of the um, patients with depression had an above-normal CRP if, cut, if the cutoff is one. So yes, it's going to affect almost half of our patients with depression um, if you use CRP as the measure. Uh, but, but could it be more useful to look at a whole panel of inflammatory markers? So this study um, looked at patients with depression and measured all of the following on the left here or, or, uh, before um, a two-year period. And if you look at this list, we usually have these in our um, patient charts already. So um, don't even need to order a CRP if we already have several of these. Um, so they measured these at baseline in a, in a group of depressed patients. And then in two years, they looked at who still met criteria for depression or who had depression again. And what they found was that um, a couple of these markers individually were useful in predicting depression. So if they had an IL-6 that was elevated or triglycerides were elevated, um, on its own, those predicted um, depression two years later. But what they actually, know, and notice that CRP is not in that list. It didn't individually predict future depression. But um, another thing they noticed was if you just looked at any four of these, um, no matter in what combination, then there was a 90% greater chance that the patient would still have depression or have depression again two years later. And they found this to, um, CRP was not individually predictive even when they um, pushed the cutoff to three, but you know maybe if the CRP cutoff was five, maybe then it would have been individually predictive. Um, other um, researchers have looked in, uh, in how to define an inflamed depression phenotype. So Kramer's model includes all these markers up in green, uh, and in addition, just the presence or absence of a um, chronic inflammatory disease, smoking status, and stress. And then I would think adding an ACE score would be useful or sleep issues, which have been known to impact inflammation. But obviously, quantifying and giving a weighted score to each of these items in a profile like this is yet to be sorted out. So how much weight would we give a, a, an abnormality in one or in one of these to know what the total you know, risk is and who falls into the bucket of inflamed depression versus not. Um, there may be ways to identify the so-called inflamed depression group being studied. Um, they're, they're looking into genotyping of macrophages, using imaging, getting CSF measurements of cytokines. All of these aren't clinically practical yet. Um, so however we end up identifying an inflamed subset of depressed patients, it matters mostly if we're actually going to change our treatment. So as it turns out, we might. Um, maybe I need to explain this slide a little bit. Oh, okay. 
in this study, um, they gave um, half patients escitalopram alone and another half set, set of patients escitalopram with bupropion. So if you sort the patients by CRP status alone, so the green is non-inflamed and the blue would be a CRP greater than one, then there wasn't really a difference in remission rate between the low and the high inflammation group. Um, the, the inflamed depression group didn't do any worse if you just mix all, um, both the people who got escitalopram and who got escitalopram and bupropion. And the remission rate was around 40%. Then they separated the data into four different groups based on both inflammation and medication choice. And then there was a striking difference. So um, those with the elevated CRP did much better if bupropion was added. Instead of a 40% remission rate, it went up to a 50%. And those with CRP less than one actually did worse if bupropion was added. So going from a 40% remission rate to only a 30%. So if you had based your treatment recs on the CRP level, then your overall remission rate would have increased 12 percentage points. It's, it's a small study, um, but it, it, makes, it illustrates this point very well. And the similar findings um, were found in a previous study um, with a difference between nortriptyline and escitalopram, nortriptyline being more effective in patients with a CRP greater than one and actually um, not being less effective if, with the, if the patient had a CRP less than one. All right, so now I'm gonna um, show from a systemic review that included um, lots of these studies um, that show really nicely here that antidepressants have differential impact if chosen looking both at the mechanism of action and the inflammatory status. So here they um, looked at research done on predominantly serotonergic agents and it was found that depressed patients with low inflammation had a higher response rate to the serotonergic dominant medications. But then if you look at the noradrenergic, dopaminergic, glutamatergic um, dominant um, antidepressants, then the high inflammatory um, status patients had a higher response. Um, so this might really be something to consider in the clinic and many, maybe many of you already are. Um, though the sample sizes in most of these studies were pretty small. So that's a, um, about changing how you might choose among antidepressants, but what about prescribing anti-inflammatories? And I was really hopeful to find some definitive, clear answers, but the long and short of it is while you're about to see, um, you know, some, some tables that I put together that show really promising estimated effect sizes, all of these studies are kind of all over the place in terms of design, bias, heterogeneity. Um, it's really uh, just to be taken as preliminary. So I'll just show you a sampling. It's too much to read on the slide, but I'll point some things out. Um, this is gonna be looking at an studies with anti-inflammatories pooled together as a class. Um, so looking at NSAIDs, glucocorticoids, um, statins, all sort of pooled data. And consistently to note is that there's better estimated effect sizes when these agents are used as an adjunct to an antidepressant, which makes sense. Um, and it, but sometimes they weren't distinguishing between an inflamed um, subset of depressed patients versus a non inflamed subset. So, who did they do better for? Um, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at these. Um, and now some studies that look at individual anti-inflammatories as opposed to pooled. And um, this is uh, things that we could maybe even use in our outpatient clinic, omega-3s, um, celecoxib, minocycline. Um, things to note here, as you already know with the omega-3s, they did well, but only if 
the EPA ratio was high enough compared to the DHA. Um, also, COX-2 inhibitors did well, but mostly as an adjunct, which makes sense. And then minocycline looks promising, but these are really small studies. And um, to note here is that adding it only beat placebo in patients that had an elevated CRP. Um, and then finally, again, I'm not truly summarizing all of these studies, but just to give you a sampling, um, looking at um, evidence for individual anti-cytokines. These probably aren't things we are gonna be prescribing anytime soon, but um, some large studies at the top here um, used patients getting anti-cytokines for their inflammatory conditions and whether depressive symptoms remitted was sort of a secondary measure. Um, and then the two studies at the bottom are small, but they specifically recruited patients with depression. And um, both showed a differential response to note here based on CRP levels. So was, these um, treatments were superior to placebo in patients who had an elevated CRP and not in otherwise the other patients. And this newest one here, um, it's unpublished as of when I looked at this a few months ago, um, it was the first study to recruit inflamed depression subtype from the very beginning of the study as opposed to post hoc. So, um, you know, maybe you're like me wondering, have I missed opportunities to help patients with depression and with inflammation in all of these new ways? Um, but you're probably also like me in already giving guidance on well-known ways to reduce inflammation. Well, each of these, um, that'll, and I'll address those in a second here, but you know, in terms of prescribing anti-inflammatories, it's really hard to interpret the literature so far. Um, and that's just not me saying it. Some of the experts still conclude that. Um, anti-inflammatories may cause harm in the patients that aren't inflamed. So they may, you know, they have been shown to do better on placebo in some of these cases. Um, in this example, patients with low inflammatory markers actually did worse than placebo when put on omega-3s compared to the patients with elevated um, inflammation. And then another caveat is that not everyone with inflammation-related depression is uniformly inflamed. So they're developing this field of knowledge um, as we speak with immunophenotyping and monocyte gene expression analysis. Um, and then again, that role of T cells has yet to be fully fleshed out. So lots of things to be cautious about, excited about, but also cautious. So again, you know, are you worried that you're missing something like I have been maybe in my residency so far in not specifically addressing this? Um, but we already know and use great anti-inflammatory um, interventions and um, exercise, diet, sleep, um, combating loneliness, combating substance use, um, using mindfulness practice practices. These are these could all be their own talk, which you guys are very well versed in. Um, in terms of their antidepressant effects. When looking at these um, studies, I would caution you to first think, okay, is there evidence that these have, that any of these interventions that you're looking into has an anti-inflammatory effect? Yes, I don't even need to go through the literature on most of these. What about evidence for having an antidepressant effect? Okay, yes, you know, there's been evidence that um, exercise benefits depression. But the key for the future literature in this field is finding that inflamed, depressed subtype of patients and then proving that each of these interventions has an effect in that population. And that um, there is one study I'll highlight here from exercise that does just that. Um, this study recruited a group of about 100 patients with depression that weren't getting better on SSRI, I believe it was just SSRI monotherapy. So they're a little bit in the treatment resistant category. And they gave everyone um, a 12 week exercise intervention. At the beginning though, they measured baseline um, inflammatory markers here, TNF alpha. And what's to notice about this group, so they're all depressed patients and some of them had, um, high inflammation at the get-go of the study, 
they all got better. Their depression scores went down. The interesting thing is the group with the higher inflammation got better faster and got better more. That's the um, dotted line here. So there is a differentiation in the effectiveness of exercise for the inflamed depressed subtype. So this is the kind of study to be on the lookout, I would think, um, in the future. Um, so to conclude, thank you for sticking with me. Depression and inflammation are associated. We know it's not the entire picture, but for depressed people with elevated inflammation, there may be specific treatments that work better. And this is a fast developing field. So I hope that you're inspired to follow this research as am I and more intentional going forward in assessing inflammation and managing inflammation, even as psychiatrists. Um, so I encourage any open discussion as I'm there's more experts in the room here than me. So um, also I have references that I can share. That's it.